Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you us watching us from wherever you are around the world. Welcome to Renault eWays, a unique event dedicated to the electric mobility of today and tomorrow. An event that brings together men and women who are taking tangible actions to meet the challenges towards zero carbon emissions. We're coming to you from Hangar Y. This is an amazing place. The Zeppelins were stored here. Uh, quite a few years ago now, at the end of the 19th century. And in 1884, uh, the first flight for the Zeppelin took off uh, from here. It was an electrically powered Zeppelin. So this is a very symbolic place for us. With me on stage today, I have the pleasure to be with the Professor Carlo Ratti. You are director of MIT Sensible City Lab, and you're also the founding partner of CRA Carlo Ratti Associati. How are you, Carlo, first of all? Wonderful, and you know, great to be here. And uh, it looks like you know this was a place where the future of mobility was tested over a hundred years ago, and so it's uh, the right place to be today. I knew you would be enthusiastic about it. Great. Um, so, as its name suggests, Carlo, uh, Renault eWays aims to explore and open up new ways, smart and positive mobility solutions, new ways of producing rethinking mobilities, and this is the topic that we're going to be talking about with you today. Um, we often talk, obviously, about smart cities, but you talk about people at the heart of sensible cities. Now, I'm intrigued. Sensible, what does that mean? At, at, when I was at school, when I was a little, I had sensible shoes, very sort of uh, practical uh, uh, something practical. Is that the case for sensible? Well, well you know, uh, I think, you know, first of all, let's see what is behind the, the idea of smart city. Smart city simply means that all of those technologies that change our lives over the past 10, 20, 30 years, they're entering the space of the city. Another way to say it is the internet is becoming internet of things. And because of that, it's changing the way we can understand, we can design, we can ultimately live in our city. So that's a phenomenon that we are living. Now, I don't like the word smart city. Smart city puts much emphasis on uh, you know, the city like a computer in, uh, in open air. And I think you know, the same technology can actually do something else, can empower people, can empower citizens to behave in a, in a better way, in a, in a more sustainable way. And that's why I like sensible. I mean, sensible is the name of our lab at MIT, but also sensible has a double meaning. First, it's able to sense, but also as well sensible, exactly as you were saying before. Practical, for example. Um, Sensible is obviously part of your DNA, and I'd like to know maybe that you can translate what that actually means through some projects that you're actually working on with the lab. Can you give us a few details? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> at the lab at MIT, we're working on many projects. Usually, most of them share the common, uh, the common process. It's about, you know, thanks to data, we can understand the city in a different way, and then we can use the data in order to, to transform things as they are. Uh, so we've been working on quite a few projects on mobility, actually some of the pioneering projects looking at sharing mobility, uh, you know, uh, similar to what happens today with Uber pool or similar things. Some of those uh, initial tests were, were done at the lab. We've been working on looking at these kind of hidden dimensions of cities, even looking at where trash is going, the type of bacteria we have in our cities, these kind of hidden dimensions we couldn't discover before. We can actually look at today and they help us to be better understand where we live and how we can improve the environment. Okay. Um, can we focus on one project that I've heard about, which is extremely exciting, which is called Rowboat, from what I can gather? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> we started um, a few years ago to work with the city of Amsterdam. And, you know, we've been uh, uh, talking with, uh, uh, with the mayor and different people at, at City Hall. And you know, the, the point was how do we experiment with mobility in Amsterdam? And when you look at the center of Amsterdam, it's an amazing city. Uh, you know, not many roads, but a lot of, uh, a lot of canals. And so we started thinking, well, instead of exper experimenting with uh, self-driving cars, uh, what about thinking about self-driving boats? And that's where the name Robot came from. And so think about the robot as a self-driving boat, but think about this as something more. It's like you know, a mobile, flexible infrastructure for the city. Uh, as you're seeing in the images, you could, uh, you could create a bridge, self-assemble a bridge with all these kind of floating pods when you need it, in case of an emergency, in case of a special event. So it becomes this kind of flexible way to use the canals and the water to, well, to reprogram them thanks to self-driving technology. And by the way, so we have the first uh, robots being tested right now in Amsterdam. So if, uh, if you're coming to, to Amsterdam, I'll take you for an autonomous tour of the canals. 
Fantastic. Will you be working with public and local authorities with this project? Yeah, you know, uh, this project is part of a collaboration between uh, <coughs> MIT and AMS, yeah. Amsterdam Am Metropolitan Solution, which includes, yes, you know, all the, the public authorities in, uh, in Amsterdam. And, uh, and I think, you know, for every project where you're experimenting with the city, with future city, cities, uh, you need to engage citizens and you need to, to engage with public authorities. Somehow, you know, the city of tomorrow is something we need to build together. And with this rowboat project as a uh, citizen myself, how will I benefit from this project? Yeah, as, as I was saying, there's a number of things. The first thing, the, ba the basic thing is you can use the rowboats for doing many of the things that happens on the canals today. So it's about moving things, moving goods. It's also about collecting garbage, waste, and so on. Um, but beyond that, you can think about this as this kind of floating pods as a flexible infrastructure for the city. One of the most exciting things is uh, we're working on now with the city, again, together with AMS, is uh, this kind of uh, bridge. We call it Round Around, which is a movable bridge, like, you know, this uh, all the robots moving in circle to take people from one side to the other side of the canals, uh, again, in an autonomous way. Fantastic. I, I, when I was preparing this interview, I was reading up a little bit, and I believe your mission is to make cities more diverse and inclusive. Can you tell us how you go about that? Yeah, well, well, certainly, you know, cities, we didn't have cities once upon a time. You know, cities emerged around 10,000 years ago. And until that time, we as humans, you know, we would live uh, as hunter-gatherers. And then humanity discovered this amazing tool in order to bring us together, to make sure that together, we're more than the sum of each of us individually. And, uh, and that's how the beginning of, the, the, that's the beginning of cities. So cities somehow like are a magnet, a magnet that brings us together. But at the same time, many often, you know, cities also become uh, places where we create segregation, where actually different communities separate, uh, where we, you know, the primordial function of the city sometimes doesn't work as it should. And that's because of, you know, putting barriers, putting boundaries. And so, again, you know, we want to make cities more inclusive. And one thing we're doing now, for instance, with the city of Stockholm, is actually looking at data, again, big data, in this case, big data coming from Telia, from the mobile operator, in order to better understand communities, understand how we come together in the city, understand then, as a result of the analysis, how we can transform the city in order to make it more, more inclusive. So again, big data can help us elucidate many dimensions of the city and hence improve them. Can we talk a little bit about technology, which is um, a service for humans, right? And from what I understand is you don't really like the word smart city because it gives that cold technological feel. Is that, is that what you're talking about? It's like the technology is, is for our use? Yeah, you know, the technology can be used in many, many ways. And also most technologies, the same technology can be used for totally different uh, uh, objectives. And it really depends uh, how you do it. Again, the same technology can be used for control. A lot of digital technologies today are actually being used for control, and that's very concerning. But it can also be used to, can be used to empower people to take better decisions, uh, to actually organize better. You know, it's kind of top-down versus uh, uh, bottom-up. And, uh, and certainly that's a very important point about what we do is we try to use technologies in a way that can give more agency to people on how they can interact with their cities. And technology will help us to interact more with the people and the environment as well? Yeah, you know, certainly technology, and when we talk about technology, especially network technologies, allow us to create new connections among ourselves, but also with, uh, with the environment. And the first thing, for instance, another project we're working on at the moment is about uh, using artificial intelligence in order to analyze zillions of, well, zillions, no, billions of images from, from cities um, and, um <coughs> and really better understand green spaces, better understand the urban environment. Again, that's the first step. We call it, uh, the project is called Treepedia. But basically, it's the first step, again, in order to improve the city, to plant more trees or to allow citizens to compare their neighborhoods with other, one, with other neighborhoods and, uh, and again, you know, take action. To, um, to make a city more sensible, you believe in micro-mobility. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what micro-mobility actually means? Yeah, well, <coughs> micro-mobility is, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very, very important. It's part of something we are seeing also today here, is this proliferation of new form factors. 
Uh, you know, once upon a time, the car was more or less the same. Now, when you move to mobility on demand, you don't need to have five-seaters all the time. And if you look at mobility in many big cities, 90% of trips are less than one or two miles. And so when you're doing that, it doesn't make sense to use something that has a big footprint on the street and also that has a weight of one ton or two tons, you know, in order to move 80 kilos for like one or two kilometers, one or two miles. And, uh, and so micromobility is the this space that we're seeing more and more. I was in, uh, in Paris over the past couple of days. It's beautiful to see all the people using, you know, uh, either bikes, e-bikes, scooters, uh, different type of segways, different type of <coughs> roller braids. Uh, you know, how this uh, proliferation of new ways to move in, uh, in the city also enabled in this case by new bicycle path and so on. So somehow, you know, how we can use, uh, again, technologies, how we can use uh, electric mobility, but with a very small footprint on the city, and uh, again, uh, create more opportunities and more offers, a more diversified offer um, for the people who live there. So micromobility is, is a complement to lots of other types of transport, is that correct? Totally, and actually it allows you to do something interesting. If you think about the 20th century, usually, uh, you know, the big multimodality centers were the big stations. There were big places where you had the train and the taxi and the buses and so on. But today you can do that uh, everywhere. You can jump off an Uber and uh, uh, jump on a scooter and take a scooter. You can get off the metro and, uh, you know, get an electric bike for the last mile. So somehow that can happen almost everywhere into the city. And that's why it's important that we multiply the kind of offer we have uh, so that that can uh, suit better, better needs. Autonomous cars is also a subject that car manufacturers are working on. Um, is electric autonomous for everybody? Well, um, I think, you know, people were very excited about autonomy probably five years ago. Well, actually, autonomy is something quite recent. Uh, you know, the first test with autonomous cars was actually a DARPA challenge in the early 2000s. At the time, nobody was talking about autonomy. And then maybe five years ago, everybody was super excited about autonomy. Now we're realizing there's still a few hurdles, so not everything has been solved yet. So it will still take a few more years before we get to level five. Level five means you can sleep in the car, the car is able to do everything you need, everything it needs to do in order to take you to the destination. But the interesting thing is we move towards autonomy, to me is actually an important point. The point is that today a car, an average car is parked 95% of the time. It's used only 5% of the time. And when it's used, it's usually a five-seater or a seven-seater, but it has one or two people inside. Now, autonomy could change that, because autonomy means that actually your car can give you a lift to the office in the morning, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family, or to anybody else in the city. So you actually allows, enables a new type of sharing that uh, can be much more interesting in the way we use the mobility infrastructure of, uh, of a big city. And, uh, and it creates, uh, if you want, some kind of new mobility system, which is in between public and private transportation. Again, if the same car is used by different people. And again, I think, you know, you might probably, will, you, you might see different types of new vehicles emerging, like bigger vehicles, like shared taxis, in between taxis and buses, or smaller pods, you know, one or two seaters, in order to, to provide individual rides. So somehow, to me, uh, autonomy is an enabler of uh, this kind of increasing proliferation of form factors and also of uh, offers for citizens. Carlo, how do you see the, the sensible city in the next five, ten years' time? Well, you know, I, I usually say I don't want to predict the future. Also, well, well first of all, many people who predicted the future in the past uh, uh, were then proven utterly wrong later down the line. But the important thing also philosophically, like the great philosopher Karl Popper said, is that you cannot predict the future. The future is what we will all contribute to, to develop and invent. Um, it's so funny, you know, sometimes I look back at what the Boston Globe, the newspaper publishing the city where I spend most of the time in Boston, uh, the Boston Globe published on the 1st of December 1900 a, a few images of how life would be in the year 2000. And you know what? They thought that everybody would be moving with, uh, with Zeppelins because at the time they were extrapolating on what they were seeing. So they thought, you know, you see here, nobody's moving with Zeppelins anymore in this beautiful place. You know, they were 100 years ago. So somehow, you know, we tend to extrapolate, but then they couldn't see 
the important things at the time, the Boston Globe couldn't see the internet or Uber or mobility on demand or electrification or uh, you know autonomy at all. So somehow you know, I don't want to predict the future. But what I would like to say is that you know every technology can be used in different ways. Every technology can be used, especially digital technologies, can be used uh, top down or bottom up. Well, I hope that the sensible city of tomorrow if you want to call it even the smart city of tomorrow, will be a city that empowers more citizens uh, and you know, that allows them to, to take control of the spaces they live in and helps them shape their environment. And just to finish, a last word, what are you most excited about now? Um, I'm perhaps you know, about the same thing, about how we can uh, use networks in order to uh, give more agency to people. Okay. Thank you so much very much for your time, Carlo Ratti. Thanks a lot. It was great to be here yeah. and uh, you know, to discover this amazing place in the center of Paris. It is quite fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very busy man. Um, if you want to follow us, you can find out all our information on our website, which is eways.group.reno.com, and I will see you very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>